The Night Envoy by Margarita Chopenko. Chapter 1 The doors opened, and Madame de Schult, her closest lady in waiting, entered the bedroom of Elizabeth with a light step. Your Majesty, she curtsied, His Majesty wants to see you for dinner. He seems to be feeling better today. Elizabeth, in a white, spacious chemise, sat in front of a mirror in a low-backed chair, while Elsa smoothed her long hair with a wide comb. A thick strand of black silk flowed through her hand. Liz gestured for her to move on to styling her hair, and, without turning her head, looked at Vivian with interest in the reflection of the mirror. Meeting her gaze, Vivian continued, His Majesty's brother, Enguerrand, and his wife will also be present. Are they already in the castle? Yes. They came this morning with the children, and took up their quarters in the left wing, as usual. Elsa pulled a small tray with long hairpins closer, and began to style her hair nicely around her head. Elizabeth looked at the sunlit window. Catching her eye, Madame de Schult walked up to it and pushed the frame open. Fresh morning air, warmed by the sun, rushed into the room and played in the curtain. How is Stefan doing? she asked. The air is well and merry. As usual, they play in the courtyard with the children of the maids of honor, under the supervision of Agnetha. Liz listened to the voices in the street, then asked, How are the preparations for tomorrow's ball? All ready, your majesty. Guests are coming. Their carriages move down the alley to unload. Everyone wants to stay at the palace, your majesty. The right wing is almost full. The rest will be housed in the summer house, and, if necessary, in the old castle. There is dampness, of course, but yesterday I gave orders to heat them. Everything will be ready. Good, said Liz. What about the kitchen? How are our cooks? Is Monsieur Corfin well? Yes, everything is in order, Vivian confirmed. The meat was brought in and is now marinating. Where's Utes? Why can't I see him? He's in the south fields, checking the beds, the mowers, and the lawns. He wanted me to tell you that all the paths will be cleaned before sunset. And then, everything will be fine, your majesty. Do not worry. There is not a corner of the castle where your clerk, Madame Fieve, does not stick her nose. Everything is in motion, and everyone is looking forward to tomorrow to see Your Majesty and His Majesty King Roland in good health and great spirits. Ah, uh, Madame de Schult hesitated. What is it, Vivian? asked Elizabeth. Your Majesty, the ladies are puzzled. What outfits should be preferred when dressing for tomorrow's ball? What tones? Hmm, I don't think it's anything special, drawled Liz. Vivian replied hastily. In what dress will your majesty enchant tomorrow's celebration? Liz, sighing and lifting her chin a little. In green. And mysteriously, I won't say anything else. Closing her eyes, she exposed her face to the sunlight. The wind ruffled the loose sleeves of her thin shirt. Elsa finished her hair, pulling and tucking the last strands, giving her head a smooth and very elegant shape. In the ensuing pause, Madame de Schult shuffled her foot in a curtsy, and, having received an affirmative nod and a gesture to end the audience, she left. Chapter 2 In Green thought Satan dispassionately. So not in blue. Meaning, she won't take an aquamarine necklace in exchange for the pearl. 
His formless body stirred heavily in the dark and narrow space of the cave. Leisurely, stretching and bending, he swam out, swaying in space with his numerous limbs moving toward an assigned direction, away from the cave, diagonally upward, into the free space of the endless night. There seemed to be no end to the long line of its large and small rounded limbs, bound together by something invisible in the middle. But here it broke away from the edge of the cave, leaving its silhouette, a sharp protrusion extending outward and upward on the highest rock, clearly visible. After a short advance, Satan hovered over the royal palace, spreading his body so far and so thin that anyone looking at the sky would think, what low clouds today, and so stuffy, it will probably rain. Alerting his system, he chose a lawn on the outskirts of the palace garden, hidden by a row of bushes and trees, and began to put Plan B into action. Satan absorbed several of his rounded limbs and extended them into very long fingers, putting two of them, those at the ends of which were on the eye, together with many others, he began to form the body of the Black Knight. Black and live, they poked at him like a sewing machine with their spiked ends. They sculpted, blew, ironed and dried, wove and braided, pulled and gathered. The right eye continuously scanned and corrected. The left directed the thorns, carrying out new installations. Straight black hair scattered out in different directions and gently settled under its own weight. Black eyebrows and eyelashes marked the features of a handsome male face with narrow slits for eyes. White teeth lined up in the open mouth. A little tan on the cheekbones and lips, overgrown on the lower jaw and over the upper lip. Hairs on the lower line of the hands, on the chest and legs. A smooth, high forehead. For a moment, the spikes froze around the body, waiting for confirmation of the completion of the first phase. The scan was successful, and approval was received. The system moved into the second phase, more visual and easy, the creation of clothing. Energy strands of varying thickness and smoothness quickly filled the space around the naked body, creating layers of clothing worn by people of the knightly class. All of its leather parts, such as belt, boots, and gloves, were additionally saturated with a special half-liquid energy, and then dried right away. Metal parts, such as sword, blade, spurs, buckles, bracelets, and heeled horseshoes, had to be cast from metal. There was no energy that could be materialized into a product of such strength and weight. Once made, they were kept in hell, the same place where they were cast. Or they could be temporarily hidden on earth. And if they remained unclaimed for a long time, they were seized and transported to hell. The same was true for jewels, stones, gold, and silver. Everything valuable, material, belongs to hell and never leaves earth. It may temporarily belong to someone, but it will always remain on earth, on its surface or in its depths. Everything spiritual belongs to a higher power. Man is born material, from flesh and blood, and by definition he belongs to hell. But his spirit is a temporary wanderer. He is brought to earth by cosmic winds, and in earthly clothes he stays his age, like a farmer during harvesting, collecting information and delivering it to the center of the universe every second of his existence, in order to replenish its reserves, and possibly set a new vector for the development of the universe. Only after the loss of the material body, in its spiritual state, does he return to that higher power, but only on condition that the material principle 
does not infect and kill the spiritual essence of his consciousness during his material life. Everything was ready. The black knight now stood clothed, but it was colorless, too light, and hovered in the space around him, not touching his body. It was visible, but not yet material. The control scan determined the completion of the second stage. The energy pulse blew density and color into it, and from that moment it became tangible, material. It could be wrapped tightly around the body, buttoned, tied with a belt. The night was ready. A dark blue velvet tunic with silver trim over a narrow waistcoat. Tight-fitting breeches of the same color. A wide belt. But his outfit did not include metal accessories. Swords, spurs, and protective bracelets, which usually completed the process of dressing. His right eye made a request to the central unit about the metal parts and received the answer that the knight had hidden them in the old cemetery outside the city, along with the aquamarine necklace. Adjusting his clothes and adding the finishing touches to the updated image of the knight, the spikes finally froze in space in some grotesque form, and then, one by one, began to quickly disappear. Only one was left, still attached to the body, stretching out in the grass. Faint purple lights rippled through it and connected it to the remote control system. But then it, too, separated and disappeared. A wave of energy ran through his body, from his toes to his head. His pupils quivered and focused in awareness of the surroundings. The knight took a deep breath and turned his head. His eyes lit up the dark space beneath the tree. He took a few steps forward and sauntered out into the clearing. Chapter 3 The warm evening of a July day descended softly to the ground, transforming everything. The grounds in front of the castle, decorated with intricate flower beds and paths between them, quietly plunged into the night. The lamplighter carried a torch. He was lighting oil lamps, suspended from poles in various corners of the terrace. But on the opposite side, a yellow light filtering through the foliage caught his attention. There should be no lantern there. What's shining? He thought. Maybe someone is coming with a torch? He walked forward a little and stopped. The black knight saw him just as the lamplighter suddenly appeared from behind the bushes. He tilted his head sharply, hiding behind the brim of his hat, and clung to a tall bush, merging with it. The lamplighter shined his light ahead, but, seeing nothing, shrugged his shoulders and continued on his way. Turning over the files of his memory, the knight recalled the events of the morning before, the meeting with Elizabeth, and his hasty departure from the castle. Her surprised eyes as she gazed at this aquamarine, unearthly blue, which was partly real. The color was changeable, and very successful in this version. The knight has stood behind a ridge of tall bushes and watched the castle. Behind the cuff of his sleeve lay a letter prepared for Elizabeth, irrefutable proof of her brother-in-law's treachery, which left no doubt that she must flee immediately. But that's only if she doesn't fall for his trick and give him that pearl necklace herself. The lamplighter disappeared around the corner of the building. Left alone, the knight went out into the clearing and searched the grass for a suitable stone. In the moonlight, the stones glowed differently. He found one of medium size with sharp corners and, standing in the middle of the clearing, swung hard, throwing it away from him as one throws a boomerang. The stone flew forward, noisily ripping through space, leaving behind a tunnel 
the ragged edges of which spread out to the sides, forming a large opening. As if grasping an invisible thread, the knight tore off and flew after the stone through the rocks and plains. Time stood still. In what felt like a few seconds, he hit the pitch blackness like a wall. He abruptly got to his feet and looked around, returning to his weighted body under the influence of real space. He glanced to his right and spotted the old, abandoned grotto, then dimmed his eyes and froze to assess the situation around him. The trees in the graveyard rustled and bent a little under the gentle gusts of wind here and there, showing the low gravestones in the moonlight. He stood there, motionless. A rustle and a faint metallic tinkle came from the other side. Slowly, he followed the path in its direction. Unencumbered by metal in his robe, he walked silently. He had no sword, but who was he to fear in this cemetery? Here, everyone is afraid of him. He is for everyone, horror and judge. When he reached the tree separating the two burial tombs, he looked out from behind it. Yes, it was Kshon. Who else? Selfish and a miser, buried three days ago, he still could not part with his gold, and sat near his grave admiring his golden rings under the moon, which glistened and shimmered with stones on each finger. Running one hand into the chest with which he was buried in his will, he played with the gold coins. Taking out a handful, he let them slide down again in a trickle, watching the golden glow. Grinning feverishly, he sniffed them, kissed them, pressed them to his wrinkled cheeks. This parade and jubilation was interrupted suddenly by the soft crunch of a branch under the knight's foot. Kshon froze in horror. He knew who it could only be to see him here and at this hour. Satan! He tossed the coins into the chest, grabbed it under his arm, and threw himself behind the gravestone. He could not retreat back to his grave while Satan himself was looking at him. I see you haven't played enough yet, he heard from behind him, and immediately saw Satan's huge figure in front of him. How long are you going to sit here? he rumbled. Kshon was afraid to look up. All he could see was the right hand in a black glove, with long, curved, black claws protruding from it. Your time is up! His fingers moved as if he was manipulating a rosary. Three days! Your soul will wither! <laughs> and even I won't need you! Get your precious ass up! He looked at the trembling figure. Oh, how I understand you. Gold. It's so sweet. Suddenly, he said in a raspy, croaking voice, But you know, <laughs> you must go to him now. <laughs> like everyone else. He clownishly threw his hand up in a feigned, obsequious pose. It is not for me to determine your future path, he finished limply. But you... His face suddenly fell and hung right in front of the face of the sitting Sean, just above his bent knees, and hissed in some whistling, guttural voice. Born to be rich! Will come to me. Don't be afraid. A thought flashed through Kshon's mind. He was going to be pulled down that furnace-sized throat. If only he could appeal to God. And this... Continued Satan, pushing the chest with the stick 
as coins scattered and glittered around. You can't take it with you. But you don't have to. There, where you will go, is a hundred times more. There, life is not for small, stupid people who do not see, do not understand the beauty and value of wealth. Wealth that gives the power to tear them apart, to rob them of everything they have, to make them sick and miserable. That's what they deserve. Let them share their crumbs. This is their lot. They who cry out to God and are desperately afraid of the devil will be afraid of you because you are the devil's power. Leave your pieces of iron. Go for real gold, which never pales. He waved his stick away from him, as if to indicate the direction, and suddenly, barely noticeably, a silvery path formed in space. Starting at their feet in the grass, it skirted the graveyard, and in a smooth, long curve went to the top. Kshon quickly gathered the coins and put them back into the chest. When he had finished, he set it on the grave, and it sank at once to the bottom. Lowering his head and not daring to look into the eyes of the speaker, he began his way along the path. Having watched the new traveler, the knight grinned at his passing and turned back to the grotto. Located at the foot of the hill, its entrance was thickly entwined with vines. The last time, he hid his sword here along with all the things he could not carry with him, and disappeared from the face of the earth. Now, slipping his hand into the vine and finding his cachet, he unhurriedly fastened the spurs, donned the sword, put his bracelets on his wrists, a few rings on his fingers, a chain with a medallion around his neck, and put the box with the aquamarine in his pocket. He also strapped several small metal tools to his belt. When he had finished equipping himself, the knight stopped. His physical image was complete. He glanced toward the castle, into the darkness that separated them, disappearing beyond the horizon. He took one of the tools from his belt, snapped the lock, and hurled it away from him into the void. The small metal cylinder made a popping noise as metal plates fanned out from him, forming a small disc rotating around its axis, cutting the air. Oh, such troublesome business to move in clothes, he thought for a moment before sharply jumping into the newly formed space, illuminating the swift path with the yellow rays of his eyes. May 2019